Artcentric Podcast with Rafi and Klee. Hola, you amazing artists. It's Rafi and Klee. And today we're going to talk about a fun uh, subject. We're going to talk about art shows and art festivals. I almost screwed up the intro there. <laughs> Um, and of course, uh, if you are listening to this and you hear us reading comments and questions and things like that, we have our amazing rogue artist family here with us, mm -hmm. uh, that always make these podcasts a lot more interesting, uh, diverse. I, I apparently am not good with words today. Dynamic and fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so hello, Clover. Clover made it. Hi, Clover. And we've got some new people here, so this is going to be awesome. A friend told me my display looked non-professional and cluttered. What can I do to make it better with without, it, without spending a bunch of oh, money? Oh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. And we also have some questions from Robert, who is here with us. Oh, great. Hi, um, Robert. And, of course, you guys, feel free to throw your questions at us regarding shows and festivals. Uh, chances are... Whatever it is, we've experienced it. But if we haven't, chances are someone here in the rogue community has experienced it. Exactly. So, well, let's get started with Clover's question since she just asked it, and then we'll go into Robert's questions. Okay, so Clover is asking, a friend told me that my display looked non-professional and cluttered. What can I do to make it better without spending a bunch of money? So my answer to this, Clover, is always I would end up just kind of building stuff, you know, and I don't know if that's something that you would do, but I would go to the hardware store and buy like the panels that you could buy for fences, like the fence board panels, and then I would use those for shelves. And a lot of times I would do tiered shelves, right? Tiered shelves are excellent. Um, I think when, and the thing is also, you know, the other thing I want to say here is take what people say with a grain of salt. Yeah, that's where my mind went to. Like, Clover, do you agree with your friend or do you like the aesthetic? Yeah, because one of the things that we did to help with the table, you know, because Clee has a lot of jewelry. She's, so it's a lot of small things that if laid out a certain way, it's going to look cluttered. Um, mm -hmm. So Yeah, uh, just to give you guys an idea, on average, I was bringing around 175 to 200 pieces of jewelry to every show we did. So that's a lot of pieces to yeah. manage. <laughs> so, of course, you know, there's the typical, like, when you're doing jewelry, you have your neck forms and you show stuff. But, like, there's a limit to how much you could show when you're doing neck forms. Um, so a lot of times it was like trays, like having trays that divided up the jewelry, the type of jewelry that was in one tray. It sectioned it off. Yeah. And I think that that, for some people that eliminates the clutter if you section off. So if you have like some, you know, some trays that you could bring out or something that would, mm -hmm. I, for the most part, like you could find inventive ways of doing it. I really liked things that served a dual purpose. So like I would transport my jewelry to the shows in uh, two boxes. One was an old file box, like from a law office that Rafi found in an alleyway in Chicago. And the other one was this aluminum rolling box. And so once I had emptied the stuff out of the boxes, I would then flip the boxes and set them on my tables to create higher surfaces to set stuff on that along with trays and various other things you can actually find stuff like at secondhand stores you know you might be able to find some and you want to go as lightweight as you can right because you don't want to be hauling a bunch of heavy stuff to shows but you can find some interesting things that might allow you to carry and display things in interesting ways like different size wooden crates and stuff yeah. like that where like you could actually um what is that called the the egg those egg things those little dolls that you like put one inside the other inside the other oh yeah the, the nesting dolls nesting like, dolls you can do that and then kind of like what uh robert's saying here is height and grouping right yeah. so that's where it's like the tiered shelves so you want to go higher in the back where it just gives people, when I would look at the tables, it gives people the ability to easily reach out and grab something versus when you're dealing with just a flat table, like it's almost like you have to bend over the table to get to the back. So you want to tear it up. And that also gives you room behind it to put extra, you know, I hate calling it merchandise, but like extra stuff that when you sell something, you could go out and replace a piece or... Mm -hmm. 
um, have your bags or, or different things like that. Like, you know, like stuff that you would hide from yeah. the customer. The, the stuff that when you walk <laughs> into a store is behind the counter. We would use uh, the undersides of our tables because we had the tablecloths with us to hide stuff. And yeah, I had a little like back area that was maybe about four inches deep where I could have my card reader, my whatever, my phone, all that good stuff. Clover is saying, yeah, I do agree. Just fumbling along. And that's fine. That's that's what we're all doing when we go out. You know, it's not like the first show we did. Everything was like great. It's mm-hmm. like you do a show and you kind of look at stuff and you're like, you know, I could, I could do this better. And even, even when it gets to the point of displaying stuff, but also taking stuff out to a show. Mm-hmm. A lot of us tend to, our first show, it's like we overdo it. Like we bring heavy shit. And... Yeah, so one of the mistakes that I made for many, many, many years was to take every single piece of jewelry that I had to every show because I could never choose what to bring. So like <laughs> you can also decide that you're only bringing half or you're only putting half of it on display and you're keeping the other half in a bin on reserve. Right. Um, So instead of putting everything out, maybe just examples of everything and, you know, send people to your website if they want to see the the whole shebang, which is something we'll be covering. Yep. Um, Also, (laughs) don't feel like you're married to your displays just because you purchased them. I have had several instances where I purchased displays and they were impractical and they didn't work and they didn't look good and I clung to them anyway because I invested in them. And what ended up happening was that I I often would end up gifting them to somebody else who could utilize them in a better way so that I could make space for things that work better for me. Don't lock yourself into stuff just because you thought it was great at one point and now you hate it and you're just digging your heels in. Yeah, be willing to be willing to evolve when it comes to your display. Um, the two components that you want to keep in mind as you're going, as you're like fumbling through this whole thing, is is it easy to take this out to a show, right? Or am I, is it like a bunch of pieces? That's why like my paintings go, a lot of times the paintings that I take out to a show are going to be like some of the larger ones are 18 by 24 because I know that I could fit a bunch of them in a bin and it's just going to be Clee and I carrying it to the space and that's one trip and now I've taken about uh, 25 to 30 paintings to that space. Mm -hmm. So it's like little by little you figure out easy ways to transport the, the work there and making the most of the space. So like, a, that's why I love the idea of nesting, right? Where you mm-hmm. have trays within trays within trays and stuff like that. We've even, when we needed extra surfaces, we've taken the, the bins that transported the paintings, flipped the bins over, threw a piece of cloth, a nice looking cloth over it, and then all of a sudden you have additional surfaces. Um, Robert said, I'm having fun cutting wood to make some custom displays inspired by a Rafi and Klee video. Yeah, eventually I realized like I cannot find what I want anywhere out there and decided to have a go at making my own stuff. And I'm very happy with that. Clover said, yeah, I've bought some things that aren't working. Yeah. The other thing, too, is some of the things that didn't work for me for shows, I put in reserve for galleries. Right. So if a gallery was interested in my work, then I had extra displays that might be more functional in a gallery setting versus taking it out to a show. And so it's good in a way if you have the room to store it, to have extra display stuff in case you're putting your work somewhere. Well, it's good to plan ahead. So like if you do have that extra stuff and you know that maybe it doesn't work for like shows and festivals, but it would look nice in somebody's shop. Yeah. Um, then yeah, hold on to it thinking future, you know, cause future you will thank you for holding on to it for displaying at a, at a business or somewhere else. Artist Haven said, I had a little three drawer cart that fit under my table and that's where I kept everything for every show. Pens, markers, cards, cash, rolls, card reader, AKA knuckle buster bags. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's efficient. Yeah, I uh, for a while there, and we didn't get to it, and it might be something that I think about in the future now that we have a garage where I could store stuff. I wanted to build a uh, gypsy cart 
that basically folded out and like gave me like wall display and stuff like that. That mm-hmm. would be easy to roll to a festival that like basically had everything inside of it. As did I. I would I I envisioned this little um, jewelry m- portable jewelry situation that maybe even had like a little work surface for me or something to that uh, to that effect to be able to do live jewelry at, at shows mm-hmm. at least minimal stuff you know yeah. maybe not torch work but maybe a little like stamping stuff and what have you we built my beautiful stand-up rolling showcase um, which I adore for indoor shows but have discovered that it's a little heavier than we anticipated and also it's not ideal for uneven ground at outdoor shows so we're still coming up with solutions for things that's one of the things that you want to keep in mind for like the shows so at one point my walls you know and there's the video online that i show uh where i built my walls i had built a much more solid structure of that where instead of just a shade cloth there was a piece of plywood in between a thin piece of plywood And I had built them almost like giant suitcases, right? So that I could keep the artwork in there because, you know, we had done a lot of shows and I was like, my least favorite part is getting to the show and like set in Florida heat. It was like super hot. So like Mm -hmm. my least favorite part is getting there, opening my wall, setting up and then having to hang each individual piece and then take them down. So I created these walls and they were great because I could keep the artwork in there. I would close them and then, you know, basically I'd get to a show haul it out of the car, set it up, open it, and then it was ready to go. All the artwork was in there. The only problem was that they were heavy. So heavy. They were heavy. So it would like take two of us to carry it over there. And then eventually like I ended up taking those walls apart and doing something else with the materials because like you want to keep that in mind. Like how heavy is this? How easy is it to transport? Like it was fine when we would had shows where we were able to park the car right next to our space. Mm-hmm. But if it was like a show where we had to like haul that for blocks for, a, yeah, it was just, it was too much. It was a trade off, right? Carrying two heavy things versus setting up a bunch of paintings. And in some cases, yeah, totally mm-hmm. worth it. In other cases, not. So having multiple options is good. On hand is like, we've had a ton of different display stands for my wife's jewelry sales. I held on to her unused ones as components for my art. So it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. I've sometimes taken stuff that Clee has and I'm like, what can I do with this? Repurpose it. Yeah. Hi, Kirkman. Hey, Kirkman. Cindy's like, are you taking orders for the Gypsy Guards? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, but we probably, you know, anything that we build going forward there will be video yeah there will be video for it when i build uh the next spinning easel because i didn't film myself building that the easel that i have but when i build my next one um i'm gonna film the entire process so that we could put it out there um so anybody that wants a spinning easel can do it i mean there's already like plans and stuff that i put out there that people have used to build their own spinning easels. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, any anytime we build anything, like when we did the displays, we want to capture that because that's a big question that we had. And a lot of times you can't find stuff that's simple. You know, like a lot of times it's like, yes, you watch a video and it's from somebody that has like a full woodworking studio. And I'm like, I yeah, am not like, going to be able to do what you're doing. No problem. Just bust out your bevel edger and your <laughs> routing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Artist Haven is like quick hack for raising your tables. Measure out PVC pipe to your table legs to make them the height you want. I use bolts and wing nuts to secure them and have them at countertop height. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good hack. Yeah. That's a good hack. That's a great hack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jenny said a very nice purchase was an extra large Hulkin bag. It's light, folds down, has wheels, and is perfect for stretched canvas. Oh, that is great, Jenny. That is a great. Great advice. I love that. Mm-hmm. Lady K's like, I need a new good easel for sure. They want so much for a good easel. Yeah. Right. And the mechanics of building an easel, it's not that complicated. You guys, that's why I've like built, I just built my own stuff. And I, and I've done that since like forever. When my kids were little, you know, they would come into my little art area and they wanted to paint and explore. So I went to the store and just bought some wood and, and built them each an easel. And it was so much less money than like going to the store and buying like easels. And not only that, but I was able to make them to size to like their little size and make them expand and, and stuff like that. So it's, if you don't know how to do it, it will seem difficult, but like 
getting the tools and doing it, it's not, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Kirkman's like blushing, thinking about my full wood shop. Well, sorry, Rath. <laughs> no, it's okay. No it's way. okay. Kudos to you, Kirkman. For hey, him. I still watch those videos of like the full workshop. The the difference is, I think to myself, like, okay, well, how can I do this with what I have? But yeah, I appreciate people that have like full workshops and are able to. Yeah, hashtag Just workshop dreams. Yeah, exactly. Clover asks, I have a bunch of tiny, tiny dice, but people look at the packaging and not the dice. Everyone loves it once I demo them, but I have to demo them for everyone. Any ideas on how to make it more clear? Oh, I would have, you know, like I would actually, when it comes to those, I would almost think more along the lines of like marketing displays that are like that, where maybe it's a small tray where you're able to stand up the packages underneath on a tiered thing. And then in front you have the, the loose dice sitting there that either they could pick up and like roll or like you can easily walk over. And instead of like demonstrating each individual one, you could show that, you know, it, it always helps when you have something like that, that is packaged to have it out and very, very clear of what, is in those packages something that people can physically touch yeah touch is huge that's one of the biggest issues that i had with like my prints right because you put the prints in a bin and yeah some people are familiar with that and they go through but for the most part people that are experiencing art for the first time like they need to have something tactile something that they can see they could touch they could you know understand like where it is so it's one of the reasons that i started doing my artist enhanced prints so that those would be hanging on the wall and people could physically go over there and see how it's going to hang versus trying to imagine what something is going to look like in a frame. And this is just a good general rule of thumb um, for whatever it is, whether it's jewelry or artwork or, you know, whatever it is. Um, if people can touch something, then they can connect with it. With jewelers, you know, like I knew a lot of jewelers that would bring out like full on glass showcases and they would put all their pieces behind glass and that's great for protecting the jewelry, but then people can't touch it and interact with it without your intervention, right? And I knew if somebody was touching a piece of jewelry that they were connecting with it more than just, you know, a pleasing aesthetic thing that that caught their eye and so that's one of those connection points you definitely want people to be able to interact with your stuff and zara actually uh your idea was kind of where my brain went to about maybe having a video on a loop that has the demo process going as well that's true like a little video i mean for for right now before having to buy like equipment or anything like that mm -hmm. to do a video I would say, you know, she says that they're in the the bottles with the wax seal. Um, so what I would do, Clover, is um, maybe have one of the bottles open and have the dice right next to it. You know, showing that like this is this is what is going to happen. I always have dice rolling space, but people don't know they can open. Gotcha. Tiny so they yeah. so there's a wax seal, and everyone thinks it's a permanent wax seal, but they are able to open them. So yeah, I think having one that is open. Yeah. With, that indicates with, like allow it have the broken seal. Yeah. So that they, it indicates that you know this opens. Even and, a little sign that says "Play with us." Yeah, play with <laughs> us. Um, you know, even a sign. You, have fun with these things. Like, have a sign that says, um, "I'm not permanently sealed," or "I open for your pleasure." You know, mm -hmm. like that kind of stuff. Um, just having fun with that, giving people. I always say, like, give people that tactile experience. That's why when people walk into my booth. You know, my artwork's very textured. Um, and one of the things I'll let them know, you know, is like, feel free to touch the art. As long as you like haven't that. been eating Cheetos. Yeah, if you haven't <laughs> been eating Cheetos, if you're not a kid with an ice cream, like you are fine, go ahead and touch the art. Ginny yeah. said, I built an easel for the cabin out of an old wooden ladder. Probably not original, but it was for me and free. Oh, that's cool. Uh, even I love better that. if it's free. I right? love that. Robert said to Clover, what about a cool dice roller display to let people interact with them? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly like that was the thing. Like, you know, that the moment that someone touches something, there is absolute there. There is a commitment that happens when someone touches something like physical touch. And when they are that much drawn to whether it's jewelry or artwork or anything where they're physically touching it then you know that they are in that decision process where this thing may have to go home with them. Mm -hmm. 
Clover said, the first thing I say and repeat all day is to pick up anything you like. Yeah, and that's where signage is going to be your friend. I, over the years, the things that I found myself saying all day, every day at shows were the things that I decided to put on signs, right? That doesn't mean you're not going to have to say it ever, but at least it's there so some people are going to see it Um Things like, yeah, we take credit cards. We take credit cards. Things like, yes, I take special order requests. Things like, you're welcome to touch the jewelry and the artwork. Just so it's there, so it does reduce the amount of having to say the things. And also, like like we had said, show by example, right? So have one of those packages open, and that's going to automatically indicate to people that they may not touch the other ones, but they'll at least play with the one that's already open. Yeah. Um, I had people really, really timid about asking me whether they could try on my earrings, you know, because earrings, it's personal, right? Um, And so that was one of those areas where, like, you know, you want to let people know that it's okay um, with signage so you don't have to say it a hundred times. Kelly said, one statement may get someone in trouble. I open for your pleasure. Yeah, I mean, you know. It it can, but it could also be fun. I like I like doing fun things like that, mm-hmm. um, where it's just like people look at it. You know, it's whenever you have signage that's going to cause people to do a second take, then you know that it's good signage. I want to sign um, on my jewelry displays. I haven't done it yet, but it's a Seinfeld quote. I want it to say, "Yes, they're real and they're spectacular." <laughs> <laughs> Because that was one of the questions I got a lot being a jewelry artist. Is it real? Is yeah. this real? And yeah. and that means different things to different people. But yes, it's real. <laughs> Cindy's like, at a fair, I picked up a little gnome and the guy was, oh, that one wants to go home with you. He will be sad if you leave. <laughs> Best sales tactic ever. I love it. I love it. I, I might get a touch me sign, said Clover. <laughs> That's great, Clover. I love it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just have fun. Remember, like, you know... A lot of people that do like markets or festivals and stuff, they tend to stick with like typical signage. Here's the irony of it, right? People try to, some people get really rolled up in trying to look quote unquote professional. And so what that means is that they have signage that looks like everyone else's signage. And people just delete that. Yeah, they delete it because they see it all day long. So that was one of the reasons like with us, you know, it was like hand painted signs, you know, everything looked really rustic and weird because like we just kind of came up with our own stuff and made sure that what was on there was not typical, that it was fun, a fun way of communicating what it was that we wanted to say. And a lot of people love that. They they would specifically point out our booth as something that was like, wow, this is the best booth in here or like all that stuff. And mostly it was because we were just having fun. We were having fun while we were out there and um, we made it easy. We made it easy for them. We made it easy for ourselves. So it was like, but that grew over time with experience. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like <laughs> you get to a point where you're doing something stubbornly for a while in a show and you're like this sucks and then you you stop and you think to yourself like how can i do this easier like how can i change this like yeah you know when it came to like the art um and people asking me the prices right and i think i responded to robert and his questions here and we'll get to robert's questions really quick Mm -hmm. um but like a lot of times people were like how much is this how much is it? And I realized like I was spending all my day answering questions about the price of art because I'm super lazy and like I'm like, Ugh, now I got to price my art and put it out there. And so I came up with the idea of laminating my price tags and putting blue tape on it, blue painters tape. And I was able to stick it directly on the corner of the painting and it wasn't going to hurt the painting or affect the painting. Mm -hmm. And when I was taking the show down, all I had to do, I could either leave it right on there and it would stay on there or I could peel it off and stick it on the inside. And that way I didn't have to like print out tags all the time. You know, they're laminated. So they were weather protected and stuff. And which is really good because tags can get really grubby looking. Yeah. So, you know, and so it's like you figure out different ways to make your life easier when you're doing the show. And the more creative it is and the more fun it is, the more different, it, the more it's going to stand out from somebody else. And the thing is also like Rafi and I had a lot 
going on in our booth. Um, we t this morning we just learned the word clutter core, which is like artistic, deliberate maximalism in a space. And I was like, oh, that's us. Yeah. We're, we're clutter core in our booth and in our house. Um, but it's curated it's over curated. time. And right. It's, it's, it's not a mess. It's not actual clutter. It's curated because like you walk in my booth and the walls were covered in paintings, right? Just covered from top to bottom, wherever there was no empty spaces. It was all paintings. And I had two six foot tables and sometimes an additional four foot table with about 200 pieces of jewelry, but really deliberately like placed and grouped into collections and yeah. Yeah, and you walk in and it's like there's jewelry, there's artwork, there's sculpture, there's prints, there's this, there's that. You know, it's it's like an eye eye gasm, you know, yeah. for anybody that comes in. Some people it was overwhelming and they, you know, they didn't they didn't know where to look. But for the most part, it caught a lot of people's attention because it was like, you know, an explosion of of art and creativity and they they loved it. Leslie said, you may have said it already, but a big smile. Oh, yeah, absolutely. A big smile can bring people into your space. And more often than not, they smile in return. Yeah, yeah, we always smiled and greeted everyone, whether they were looking like they wanted to come in or they were just passing by and met eyes with us always. And this is powerful, you guys, because it is very easy for people that are doing a market or a show where like sales are not happening or you know whatever is going on or it's hot or again that's one of the reasons that we made the entire process easier and easier because they're like oh this is a pain in the ass or like i'm sweaty or it's too cold or it's too hot and it's easy to get focused on that and forget to smile and have fun and that's why our priority when it came to the shows was we are getting in the mindset of like, this is going to be fun. We're here to meet people, right? Mm -hmm. We're not here to sell stuff. We're here to meet people and introduce ourselves as artists. Um, so it didn't matter if, you know, we spent four hours without having a sale. We were still going to have fun and meet people because we were really accounting our success to how many people are we having conversations with? How many people are we having the opportunity to meet with? And, you know, um, eventually we did, you'd have some sales and stuff, but like, because that wasn't our focus, we weren't one of those typical um, market vendors or artists that would come by after three hours. It's like, how's your day going? And what they mean is like, have you made any money? You know? And it's like, you know, it, they'd always surprise them too. Cause like on a really slow day, we'd be like, oh man, it's been a blast today. I'm having great fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lady K is like, my signage has always sucked, lol. I have a cool banner with an oceanscape on it, but it's so corporate since that's what I was being taught to do. Yeah, Lady K. And that's the thing. It's like, I've seen a lot of artists that have those banners printed up and that's cool. You know, it's cool, but in my mind, I'm like, we're we're artists. So I'm like, if we're going to do if we are going to go the banner route, let's go. Let's go different. You know, let's do something weird with it. Let's mm -hmm. have fun with it. Let's really showcase our art. There's nothing. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with the banners. But the thing is that, like, you're creative and your booth should be your space. You know, it's it's like for like almost like a like a tidbit of your life that somebody is walking into when they do a show and that's the thing you want to make it as comfortable for yourself as possible without worrying too much of like what looks professional what's you know it's like they don't care they're not gonna like look at one artist and look at another and be like oh their booth looks very corporate and very professional so i'm gonna go there like that's not how people shop i mean and if they do shop that way then good for them then they can go to the one that looks corporate you yeah. know, like, cause that's their aesthetic or whatever. And so. the thing is that if you already have the signage, you could tweak the signage. You mm -hmm. could have fun. If you're like, ah, this looks a little stale, then make it fun. Make it fun. This is a fun way to pre-qualify people, right? Because if your booth aesthetic is you, then your people are going to see that and they're going to tractor beam towards it. We had this kind of gypsy clutter core Barnum and Bailey thing happening um, that we still have. And when we get back into doing shows, we'll still have. And our people 
would see it and be like, I like that. I just want I want to go there. <laughs> I want to see what that's all about. Um, Lady K wants to know what are, what's your opinion on virtual art shows? I love them. I love hosting them. I love attending them. But the caveat there is when we host a virtual show, the art sales are secondary. It's more like a party. Yeah. <laughs> with music and stories and Q and A and then. Yeah, we're going to show some art. No pressure. That's the thing to remember, you guys. Like, whether you do a virtual show or you do a show in person in a gallery or something like that, right? There's this typical idea of, like, the blank walls with the artwork and the cheese and the wine and all that stuff. And truthfully, like, that's going to bring somebody out for a moment. But, like, if there's entertainment, if there is if it, there, there is more to creativity than just like whatever like creativity is the thing art music writing poetry that kind of stuff like all of that stuff people literally leave their house to go to a place to listen to music they leave their house to go to an event where there's artwork they leave their house to go and be entertained from their humdrum life so that's one of the reasons that like whenever we do shows or whether they're virtual or whatever it's like this is this is giving people a respite from their life, right? There is no reason for anybody to come to any of our very show, none whatsoever. Um, sure, the artwork's great, but like really, is that going to keep them there? You know, unless someone is specifically going to a place to purchase a particular work of art, they're just going to see, they're just going to be entertained and then something calls out to them. It's the same thing when you go see a band. You go, you have a few drinks, the band is playing, and there might be a song that really you're like, holy shit, this is awesome. You know, and that's that's the thing. It's putting yourself out there in that way to give people and entertaining people and giving them the opportunity to fall in love with what you do and who you are. And putting yourself out there is setting up your booth. Is this booth me? doing a virtual show and being like, what kind of things am I interested in? You know, like, what kind of things do I love? We were excited about this house. So when we did a virtual show here, we did a tour of the house. Yeah. We play music. We do all this stuff. And it's like having fun. Um, there are so many people that do a virtual show and they're like, you know, they don't even give a tour of their studio. They don't, you know, there's nothing else they're excited. They're just like, this one is dot, And I, dot, will, dot. I will say this. There's the nerves when it's your first yeah. one and overcoming that. So... The first one can be a little bit stiff, right? Ours even was. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we had technical difficulties and all this stuff. Um, but then once you loosen up and get comfortable, yeah, embrace the other things that you can bring to the table to make it an experience for people. Zara said, that's like a friend of mine suggesting that my website was too colorful and busy, right? And that's... That's your aesthetic. That's your people are going to love that and gravitate. Jenny said, oh, that's such a horrible feeling when you don't get acknowledged or you feel judged or categorized when looking at art. It feels so pretty woman. <laughs> it does. It really does. That's a great way of putting it. Yep. Robert wants to know, I just made a six foot by two foot banner for the front of my table, but how do I hang it there? It does have grommets. If you, so here's what I would probably do. Now, we always hung our signage from the canopy bars, but for a table, if you've got one of those thick plastic fold-out tables, I would just drill holes right where you need them you could hang the, for the grommets yep. and use carabiners or even wire or even those um, reusable bendy um, thingamabobs they sell at the hardware store. The bendy store. thingamabobs, yeah. Oh, or zip ties. Yeah. And don't be afraid to drill right into the plastic or the wood on the table and add something that's going to make your life a lot easier. Because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of times people forget that they can do that, right? It's almost like, I don't want to ruin this. But it's, it's yours. Like, it's yours. So, you can you can ruin it. Um, and if you're having a tablecloth over it, then you might even want to put holes with uh, grommets in the cloth itself so that the fabric doesn't fray, but you can still get right through there. Leslie wants to know, have you played music or had music playing quietly when in your booth? Have my DJ gear ready to use. Oh, yeah. And yeah. depending on the show, yeah, definitely. Um, I would often light Palo Santo pre-show just to have the Palo Santo good vibes and aroma in the booth. Sometimes music and sometimes I just liked listening to the sounds of the show around me. 
often and frequently at the market we did, they would have live musicians on every block. So that was really cool to kind of set the mood. But it's the whole sensory experience for sure. So employ whatever tactics, scent, uh, sound, all of it. All the, all the touch. All, yeah, all the things. Because it's your space. You're going to be, you're going to spend some hours there. So you might as well make it yours and comfortable in some place that you want to, you want to hang out in, you know, like we used to for like really hot shows where we had electricity. I grabbed the box fan and uh, put hooks in it and wired it. So it would sit at the top of the booth and just like blow, it was so circulate good. the air out. Right. For us, not for, you know, and that's the thing is that like a lot of people do things for that, like, how am I going to bring the customers in? And like, really, a big part of that should be, how am I going to make this comfortable for me? Because if you make it comfortable for you, you're going to make it comfortable for your people to be in there. And that's the experience that we've had. Um, so Robert's like the table is being provided by the venue oh, while I'm okay. showing up with a drill. So one thing you can do <laughs> just as a temporary solution is have the banner kind of have like two inches worth of banner sitting on the tabletop and then just weigh it down mm -hmm. with something. You could do that. If you want to get really technical about it, you could buy um, a thin piece of plywood sheet, right? And you wouldn't even have to like have a big sheet. You could have a part of the sheet that goes up one side, you know, like where you lay it on the table and it already has like a little piece with a hook that will go in front of the table. And then that would lay underneath like a tablecloth or something like that. You know, if you can't drill any holes in the table mm -hmm. um, <laughs> or you drill the holes in the table and nobody knows. Zip ties are zip ties are necessary. Your friend for all things. Something that you can zip tie it to even that'll make it stay in place temporarily. We also um but you know velcro like adhesive velcro but the adhesive on velcro can be pretty hardcore so um Clover said I run a string over the table and tie it to the back legs. That's genius. brilliant. That's brilliant. That's a really good idea. We've done that. So for the shows um here was, it, this was in our kit bag, um, zip ties, long zip ties, short zip ties. We also, you know, you, you go to Home Depot or the hardware store and for like aluminum, like fences, they have that aluminum wiring that comes on a spool. We had a spool like that so that, you know, it's easy to cut and it's easy to bend and fold. So whenever we needed to like wire something up, or make hooks or make in a hooks pinch. in a pinch or whatever like we had that so like that roll of aluminum wiring and um zip ties uh duct tape for big emergencies in case we needed to like close a hole or something like that little blocks of wood that we could shim the table legs yep. with yeah a little there was a case of little blocks of wood that i cut out of two by fours that we could shim the table a towel a towel always have a towel carabiners <laughs> Uh, we had carabiners and S hooks. So all of that was inside this case, this box. Mm -hmm. We also had a staple gun. We had a staple gun just in case we needed to like staple something. We to rarely something did, else. but yeah. I also had random rocks that I could use as paperweights to as weigh weights. down my signage yeah. when it was sitting on the table. Like river stones. I think we had river, river stones, stones for that. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, those are those are the the things definitely. On hand said, I never thought of it as entertaining and welcoming people. I like that much more than how I used to think of it as show your stuff so people know what to buy from me. <laughs> yeah, make it a party. It make takes it the party. pressure off of you. It takes the pressure off the people that attend, and that way they feel comfortable and they can buy if they want to, and they can just enjoy if they can't buy or don't want to buy. And it's like that's a much better environment for everybody. And it's much more conducive to having a good time and being an experience that people will want to be part of again. Yeah. Um, Tyler said, so much good info, taking notes. Oh, thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Tyler. Clover said, oh, you read that already. Thank you, Leslie. Leslie's like, hit the thumbs up, bro. <laughs> um, Artist Haven said, picnic tablecloth, clampy things, clamps. Clamps. Yes, clamps. Thanks for the reminder. Bag of clamps. <laughs> Um, All different size clamps. We also had, you know, the work clamps with the, that come with the clamp. So like for outside shows, uh, just in case, like 
a lot of this Indie Explorer we had in the cabinets. We just kind of kept it in the car so that whenever we did a show, like it would be there if we needed it. Mm -hmm. So it was like those work lights, we would have those with LED bulbs and extension cords. So if we knew we were doing a nighttime show, we already had, you could just kind of like clamp these lights all over the the canopy and, and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. um, if you sell jewelry or you have any kind of thing that people are going to wear on their body, have a mirror mm -hmm. and make sure it's not a breakable mirror. Yes. <laughs> um, people just instinctively want to see how they look in things, even if it's holding a t-shirt up to their body or holding a pair of earrings here or whatever it is. I have these little unbreakable mirrors that I bought just from a jewelry supply website and they have a, a rectangle base and then the mirror hinges down so it lays pretty flat in storage. Mm -hmm. And they're not that big. It doesn't need to be a huge mirror, but a, something for people to look at themselves if you have anything like that. Yeah, the plywood hook suggestion is amazing. Thank you, wood solves most problems. Yes, wood does solve most problems, it's Robert. True. Clover wants to know, has anyone done an artist stamp rally? I... Rogues, feel free to, to answer that question yeah, i have not that's something i would have to look up and see what it is um yeah, yeah that's new to us but rogues definitely chime in with that let's talk about a couple of these questions that robert um had asked previous to the podcast yeah let's do it so the first question is is it okay to have a sign that says something like shop more of my items on etsy or have a qr code link to your shop absolutely, absolutely. you definitely want to be letting people know that i have more stuff for you to peruse on this website now you know you guys know that we recommend send them to your own website rather than a platform you if got, you can you guys know that we're not anti etsy because etsy is a great place to start but even when you're just getting started on etsy use it as a stepping stone to get to your website mm -hmm. you know like learn what you need to use them while you're there because that was one of the things that i had a struggle with we always promoted ourselves online right so but in the beginning i for five years of us putting ourselves out there we were sending people to our etsy store and you know little by little you start to realize that like people that shop on etsy shop on etsy mm -hmm. you know so um we've been luckily when we started our website we started sending people to our website and you the way that websites work is these in-person events or like virtual shows, that's your opportunity to get them familiar with your website, to get them to go to your website. Because in all honesty, unless you have a blog or you have something interactive, there's no reason for them to just go to your website. So always, always, anything that's in person, promote your site. That's why mm -hmm. it's important to not take everything out to a show um, and even, a good idea, you know, is if you have a lot more artwork to even have like a physical catalog on the table where people could like peruse and they could grab one of your cards and they could visit your site mm -hmm. or having a tablet. I, I've seen some artists where they have a tablet with their website open on it. I think that's badass. It is badass. Yeah. Um, I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> well, great. Um, it, oh, yeah, I remember. If you're not ready for your own website, that's, of course, yes. okay. You can have plans for a website in the future. And, yes, uh, wherever you have a presence online, definitely be sending people Use there. QR codes. Not everybody knows how to use QR codes, but a lot do. So use QR codes. Use websites. Use, you know, have it on your business cards. We have business cards. We have little postcards as well that we give people when they buy something or they're just out and loose um that's one of the reasons that i love the idea of like virtual stuff where maybe you're doing something on you know that people have to go to your website to get to maybe a live stream like a virtual live stream and it's something that you're doing online with your website that when you are doing these shows you could promote that and have like little like flyers that say like we're going to be going live our virtual you know, appreciation art show is going to be happening online on such and such date. And that way, you know, like that's the way that we use the market. That's the irony. We weren't there to sell stuff. Mm -hmm. We were there to like meet people, have a party and like invite people to our next party 
online or whatever cool thing that we were doing. Yeah. And that's really the best way to get the word out there is to like do things, inviting people to the next thing that you're going to do and make sure that the thing you're doing is fun for them. And if they have fun or they are, you know, they walk into your booth and they feel at home and they're interested, then they'll definitely want to come to the next thing. Yeah. But it's your job to let them know. You have to let them know that it's going on. So yes, QR codes, let them know I have more items on Etsy, all that stuff. Have, mm -hmm. have fun with that. Um, Robert's next question, which is a great question, is should my prices be the same as my existing online shop items or do you run a market special? Yes to both. I believe in consistency with pricing. The prices are the same on the website. They're the same if you see me at a market. They're the same if you see my pieces in a gallery. Basically, wherever you see my work, my prices are the same. However, I was known to run a market sale. Mm -hmm. Like if you happen to be here today and you see this thing, these things are on sale only for this market. Um, and I did those um, sometimes selfishly. I did them um, so that I could have stuff priced at a rounded dollar amount so that I didn't have to make change for people. Yep. So I'd be like, these are on sale for 20 bucks. Yep. <laughs> um, and sometimes I just did it as a thank you for coming out to see me at this market or this show, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with running a market special. No, Robert, th th this is your art. These are your things. Like you could, you could do whatever you want with them. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, there's no prerequisite. Not everybody's going to agree. There's going to be artists out there that are like, well, you should, bleh. you know, like whatever it is that they say, but like, you know, you want to be fair to the people that have bought from you, but also, you know, those people are going to, those people are also going to take advantage of stuff like that. You know what I mean? Where I've had some of my collectors come in, all my collectors, uh, just off the bat, if they've bought art from me, they are eligible for a 10% discount. They're going to get a 10% discount mm -hmm. on anything that I do. And if I really like them, the discount might be even more. You know what I mean? So it depends on the situation and the circumstance. But yeah, we've done that virtually as well. Like if we're doing a virtual art show, a big thank you to the people that took time out of their day to come and hang out with us is we're going to give them a discount for being there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like I, we would do the same thing at the market sometimes, like, you know, especially if there was something going on, because it also gives you the opportunity to like promote a thing. Be like right now, you know, like uh, as a big appreciation. And I... That's where I would say, like, maybe not a market sale. I always like the term appreciation sale, right? Because it puts my mindset in the right place. Because the mindset of a sale is like, I'm going to put this on sale so I could sell it. But that's not a good reason to, like, put it. So for me, it was like, you know, with the virtual shows, it's an appreciation of you coming and taking time out of your day to hang out with us. If it was a market show, it's appreciation for you coming and showing up and in person and picking this up. Robert said, I just envision people looking at my Etsy shop and comparing prices, although they then pay shipping too. So one of the things I make sure, we both make sure we do this, if you are running a sale, make it very clear that this is a sale price, the original price is the normal price is this, this is a special that I'm running so that nobody thinks that this discounted price is the normal price. Right. Make it very, very clear Right. Um, on sale today for this market, for yeah. this show. Make and, sure your and, signage says it. And that's why here's the retail price. This is what it's selling for, mm -hmm. you know, today. But, and, and, you know, and it's funny because that's a marketing tactic. Today only. You know, like, yeah. oh, you only get it for this price today here. But I do believe in consistency. And one of the reasons for that is because selfishly, I didn't want that cringy feeling of having to explain to somebody that it's this price here. But if you go on my website, it's more like, mm, or, I don't want or that. Or it's this price here. But if you go on my website, it's less, mm -mm. you know, like, no. you just, <laughs> you want it all the same price across the board. Yeah. And that, that way, when you run a sale, it's like, oh, okay, cool. It's on sale. That's one of the reasons that when we do in, in the pricing book, when we talk about like you know also prepare for the fact that maybe someday you'll get into a gallery so slowly start inching your prices up so you can pay the gallery so that you commission. can pay the gallery commission and still make your your typical profit mm -hmm. you know because like people are like well it's a lot more at the gallery because this they take out this percentage so should i sell it for less i'm like no because the gallery is getting paid for what the gallery is doing when you're doing a show you're the one getting paid for 
putting your artwork out there, talking about your artwork. You're doing the gallery's work. Transporting your artwork, promoting your artwork. So like that's, you got to think of these percentages as like, it's not just the work that I put into the art. It's also the overhead of all the stuff that I do in promoting my art, right? So it took a lot of effort for me to get this art in front of you, in front of the right person that fell in love with the art, you know? So it's like, you want to make sure that you you want to make sure that you're fair to yourself when it comes to your pricing. You want to make sure that you're fair to the collector mm-hmm. as well. I mean, that's really where it goes. And that's 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 an ongoing that's a conversation for another day. That's an ongoing thing it that is. you are going to work through your entire career as an artist. I will say this though on this topic also that you're fair to the people that you're partnered with. Uh, the fastest way to ruin a relationship with a gallery or have bad blood is to be selling your work for less than what the gallery has it for, right? Then essentially you're undercutting the gallery. A lot of galleries... With, same, with the same work. A lot of galleries won't do business with you if you are selling your work for a lower price than what they have it for. Why would they, right? That's that's kind of a jerk move to do. So consistency. Consistency <laughs> across the board. Um, so when you have to pay those uh, gallery fees or those platform fees or those whatever, like it just is what it is across the board. Tyler said, I'm finally putting my art on Facebook page, but I'd love to eventually make what? Yeah, little Future by little. Goals future goals we didn't start we had a wet we did have a website but like we weren't really sure what we were doing with it and we were selling on etsy and like all that stuff so like and promoting ourselves on social media so you just do it little by little and you get there you know like it's it's a marathon it's not Mm -hmm. you know i i obviously am a strong advocate of have your own have your own land on the internet you know your own website stake your claim stake your claim but at the same time like Sometimes it takes time to get there. Building a website is not, you know, simple. It's going to take time and energy, and you want to make sure you have that time and energy to be able to do it the way that you want to. Mm-hmm. Fully understanding that you're going to screw it up a bunch of times, mm-hmm. and it's taken me years to get my website, our website, to look like how I want it to look. And function. Yeah, and every year that changes. I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, you got to change this <laughs> thing, or you got to change that thing. So it. it's, a, it's an ongoing thing, and you got to really be at a place where it's like, all right, I'm going to (laughs) Tyler is like manifest that internet destiny. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Tyler, Dan, who said putting up with people's nonsense fee. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You're doing the legwork, right? Is there uh, me with a shotgun? Get off of my land. Get off of my land. Okay, so Robert's last question is, do you put price tags on individual pieces of jewelry or do you just have a price list? And this depends on the scenario, but here's how I tackled it. One of the things I discovered straight away is that people don't like to ask the price, right? So you got to have some way in which they can see the price of things without having to interact with you because some of them don't want to, or people, they don't know yet if they want to. And people have a hard time talking about money. Yeah. Some people. So you got to make do. it easy for them. So out at shows, even though aesthetically I didn't like how tags looked on individual pieces and I found workarounds, which I'll discuss, every piece of jewelry was had a tag. I made my tags out of cardstock paper, so um, pretty cost efficient and, and what have you. Um, if I had a tray of pieces that were all the same price, then I had one tag on the side of the tray that said all the pieces on this tray are this price. That was easy and great. And I could even tuck it into the side of the tray where it was visible but not an eyesore. If each piece on a tray was a different price, then I had the tags pinned to the pad above the necklace, but I tucked them into the top of the tray so they were neat looking yeah and all i had the plastic trays with the velvet pads with the pins that you stick in them and so the tags were just tucked in up above the jewelry where they were not an eyesore but they were obvious to somebody who wanted to see the information that's how i handled it at shows and then people would pull those tags out and look at them and leave them hanging there and that was fine because then i would putz around and tuck them back in. And some people on occasion wouldn't see the tag and I would show them. 
And that's how I handled it at shows. And once, once you show them one tag, then they, they, then they know. know, like, okay, mm -hmm. well, I could check out any of the other tags. If yeah. I had ongoing collections that were always the same price, then I would have the laminated tags that would sit in front of or on or behind a grouping that would say adjustable rings for this price or what have you. Um, at gallery shows, like when I have my rolling showcase, I have found it easier to have a visible price list. In fact, so my showcase is a three-tier showcase. So on each level, I have a laminated price list that just sits and looks nice in front of the pieces mm -hmm. um, on the pads. And it would be like from left to right in order of appearance. This is the little description with the price. So for for indoor gallery shows, it was a different approach. But yeah, for markets, that's how I did it with the tags. Tags tucked in, neat looking, little strings. And I would have to sometimes redo them if they got rumpled or rained on or whatever. Klee is very fastidious when it comes to tags. Mm -hmm. She's very organized. I am not. I have at times sold a work for what it was priced three years earlier because the tag <laughs> that was on there was three years old and I never updated it when I raised my prices. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I'm fine with that. Yeah, you know, Rafi's like, like whatever. Like, whatever. Like I'm gonna create a lot more work, so like I'm I'm you know, doesn't matter. It's hanging on somebody's wall, they love it, they paid me for it, I'm good to go. Rafi has also like straight up had to pull up our website and like find the painting. Oh, yeah. It's it's bad. Because it had guys. no tag. It's bad. When we did our gallery show, I walked around and I put tags on everything. But it was real humid. And it, no, it was like when we started the gallery show, I walked around, put tags on everything. And then later on during the show, you know, it's really busy. We're talking to a bunch of people. Somebody came up. And they were like, how much is this one? And I looked over and I was like, why isn't the tag on there? And then I looked around and there was a stack of 25 tags for random artwork that was just sitting on a table that I had just completely forgotten. As had I. And then at that point, I was like, well, I don't I don't even know which works these are, right? Because like I, a lot of times I title my work. I don't memorize the titles of my work. I title them in the moment and then I might forget. So I'm like, okay, I don't know what this is. And they're there. So you would think we were there for two months that I would have hung those tags on the artwork. I never did. The stack just kind of sat there for two months. And, you know, when people asked me about the art, uh, then I would go and look for the tag. And it's like, I th I'm pretty sure it's this one. I think it's this one that's called In the Glow. I'm terrible. A friend of ours at terrible. one point actually took some of the tags around and tried to guess which yes. ones belong. And she actually guessed she, right. She guessed right. She a guessed lot right. of the time. I title my paintings pretty good. Mm -hmm. Even even though I forget, yeah. I can usually tell what what belongs with what. But yes, I am fastidious about... Some people have no problem asking the price of something, but the majority of people don't want to ask the price because they don't want to feel like they're committed to then engaging in cost discussion or feeling awkward if it's outside of their budget. So make it as easy for them as possible while still remaining true to your aesthetic needs and desires. I mean, think about it this way. When you go somewhere and you're looking at stuff and you're just kind of looking at stuff and you're just curious, right? You're not, you like it, but you're, but you're not sure if you're going to commit to a sale. Yeah. And you walk into a booth and then you want to know like, well, how much is this? Um, and in some environments, like people are afraid to ask because it's like the moment you ask and all of a sudden it's like the person is like, oh my God. Here we go. And then they, they go into sales mode. And that's what a lot of people are used to. Um, we're never like that. So it's no. like, you know. But people don't know that about us unless know they know us. Exactly. Exactly. So it's just things to think about while you're there. And most importantly, you guys, when it comes to like art shows and festivals, just have fun. The fun factor is across the board the most important thing. Yeah. And if you're not having fun, find a way to have fun. <laughs> find a way to have fun. 
Cindy said, I just applied for my assumed name. They will be in paper soon. Now I'm starting the website. So nervous. Congrats, oh, congratulations, Cindy. Cindy. That's awesome. Wendell said, hearing the story of the tags helps me a lot. I would have left them on the table, too. So many things I am sure I will do eventually. Eventually, yeah. yeah you know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it's fine. Nobody cares. In fact... When people ask me, I was like, I went over, I was like, oh, I guess I didn't price my artwork. And they laughed. You know, it's like people, people are human. If, if, if the person asking me for the art was like, I can't believe you didn't put the tags on there. I'd be like, oh, I don't, I don't even know if I want you to buy my art, you know, like, and it's, it's one of those things that's, we get so worried about getting things perfect and not screwing up. And the truth is we're going to screw up every single time. So you might as well embrace it because then, you know, you get to grow from the experience exactly. or be like, you know what? This isn't a big deal. I don't I don't care as much. I had on more than one occasion tags that I thought were OK attached to jewelry neck forms like hanging off the back. The, and, you know, I don't always like look at every single one because 200 pieces of jewelry and... <laughs> They would have been like rained on or soggy from humidity. And like the tag literally said nothing except this blur of ink. <laughs> and someone would look at it and be like, um, what's this one? <laughs> and be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to have to redo that. Um, and it's little stuff like that. It but just, yeah. It's just a work in progress all the time. Every experience. Robert is... has a few more questions for us. Okay. Let's get to those before we end the podcast. How do you display a sales tax certificate without being obnoxious? I, okay, I always kept our resale certificate in a bag on me, right? Because yeah. customers are not going to ask you for it. A sales tax rep might be walking the grounds checking and they say that you have to have it displayed in a prominent location, but as long as it's on you, it's fine. So yeah. I kept it in my business bag, is what I called it. And it was just there, it was protected. I didn't actually display it. You could put it in a little frame and just lay it somewhere. I mean, you <laughs> could you could put it in a little frame, like just a little frame or like in a little baggie, and then get one of those magnet clamps. You know, the the those cheap clamps that you buy that have the magnet on the back. And then just kind of stick it in one of the top corners of the canopy. Um, you yeah. know, that, that would be good enough. Or just keep it in a bag. With all the shows that we've done, we have never had anybody come in and ask for that. And if they did, we had it on us. And, you know, if they were like, you need to display this in a prominent location. Then we had, that was another thing that we had in the bag, by the way. We had magnet clamps and magnet hooks that we could just stick on the canopy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Robert's second question, how much cash or change to bring? A hundred is a good average. Um, and, you know, a lot of small bills, basically the whole array of big and small bills to make change. A hundred is a good amount yep. to have, unless it's a big, big, huge show, and then you probably want to have 200 or yeah. more. Um, do you incorporate sales tax into your prices or remit after? I add the, th my prices are my prices before tax. And so I always let people know you know, if they ask, for example, this is fifty dollars plus tax. Plus um, tax, yeah. Sometimes they would ask, "Is there sales tax?" And the way we figure it out easy is that we use Square. We mm -hmm. use the Square Reader, so it figures out the. So tax. if it's a credit card, you know, you could program it to have the sales tax in there already, so that when you pull it up, um, you know, sixty dollars. Okay, it's going to be sixty-two, blah blah blah, and then you let them know it's going to be sixty-two, blah blah, and they're like, "Okay," you know, because everybody knows that like you're going to pay. It's very rare that we've run into somebody that was like, what do you mean you're charging tax? It's I've like, never had anyone get upset yeah. about tax is just tax. Tax is tax. It's an obligation for me, for you, for all of mankind. Yeah. <laughs> um, cash, obviously, it's a little trickier because then you have to make change with coins. Um, don't tell your friends or anyone this, even though it's a public podcast. But sometimes I would just eat the sales tax for cash sales because it was just easier to make change for yeah. rounded dollar amounts. But yeah, with cards, with Square, it was easier. You know, it just, it adds the tax and then you get your tax report at the end of the quarter and you can see exactly what you collected and what you have to remit. But I never rolled tax into my pricing, except in the very beginning I did. And I had a little chart that helped me calculate the amount before tax and all that business. That's getting into a complicated thing that's a whole other topic yeah it doesn't add um, up it doesn't add up at the end it's so. hard 
just yeah so i just i my my subtotals are my subtotals before tax it's twenty dollars plus tax it's a hundred dollars plus tax whatever yeah. and you know that's how it is on our website too if you're mm -hmm. a resident of our state <laughs> you pay you pay sales tax um, yeah. but you know you got to do whatever makes the most sense for your brain jar also yeah i'm not saying that our way is the way it's just how we do it um clover just eats the sales tax if it's cash and charge it if it's card yeah and so i don't i also don't tell people up front this is this is not um legal advice legal advice it's let's, not you let's guys have that disclaimer on there we're not tax professionals and this is not legal advice yeah. i would also never tell people up front that i'm going to eat the tax if it's cash i i would just say across the board it's this plus tax and then if they say well what if it's cash <laughs> Then you deal with that case by case. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how we handle it. Clover also says, in my state, at least, we don't have to display it. Just have it on hand if, if they, they come, come by. by. Yeah, and that's that's pretty much the way it is. I think it'll it'll say like you have to. It has to be displayed in a prominent location. But really, that's more for a brick and mortar location. You know, like a permanent location. Yes, like we have our um, thing displayed in our in our as you enter the gallery. gallery. Yeah here susan wants to know with pricing have you written it in pencil on the back or put the tag in the corner on the back during transport to the show i never use pencil um on any of my tags i'll just say that because pencil is way more susceptible to wearing off or getting smudged than yeah. ink. although if ink gets rained on that's a whole other ball of wax but she might be asking about the paintings when pricing writing it directly on the painting yeah no i don't write it on the painting i like i'll print out a tag or i just look it up on my website you know mm -hmm. that inspires me to you know because a lot of times i'll finish a piece and then i'm like oh it's so cool and i hang it up on my wall and i want to take it out to a show so it'll inspire me to have it on the site. That way I know the name, I have the price of what it's gonna be, I've got my description on there so I can remember the, you know, my meaning behind it and all that stuff. So I, a lot of times I use that and it, I could easily search for it on my website. That helps me to really understand navigating my site as well in case I'm telling somebody, well, you could purchase some of my artwork on the website and they're like, how do you purchase it? Well, I know exactly how because I'm constantly navigating my own site. Um, as far as putting the tag in the corner on the back, yeah, Rafi does that all the oh, time. Oh, yeah. Tucks the tags into the back corner for transport. Yeah, so, so the tags, uh, Susan, if you were here earlier, I said a lot of times when I do tags for shows, I um, print out just like a gallery tag, you know, your name, the medium, what it's on, um, the price, my website, you know, all the information that I want to have on a tag. And then I laminate that and then I will stick it in the back. But for certain shows, when I remember, I'll pull it out of the corner of the back. I have blue tape and I just stick it right on the painting. The blue tape doesn't, doesn't stick to the painting. You know, I make sure that it's not anything on paper, but like when it's acrylic or oil or anything like that, the blue tape is just going to keep the tag on there the lamination is going to keep it from curling up with humidity mm -hmm. um and it keeps it pretty nice and new and clean which so I is can reuse it the laminating is awesome if i had permanent tags i did that i was pretty careless for with um tags that i knew were short-lived like pieces that moved quickly and i didn't need the tag after that i just left them exposed to the elements but because i was making my tags out of cardstock cutting them on the paper cutter punching a hole, running a string through. I was like, eh, if it gets got, I'm not worried about it. And we're getting, we're over time, so I want to leave you with my, a final thought, which is my biggest regret that I learned the hard way in doing shows, aside from not promoting our own website straight away. But that was, a, you know, that, that was part of the journey. My biggest regret was taking work out to shows that I had like finished the night before and not getting pictures of those pieces, thinking I'm probably not gonna sell it and I'll be able to take it home and photograph it later. Photograph the work for the website. Make sure you have pictures of the art for your website before it goes to a show because the next thing you know, someone's buying it and you didn't get a picture and there's no good spot at the show to take a picture and you don't have a good picture of this piece of art and it's forever gone and then you ask your client to take a picture of it and they send you a blurry picture that looks like they ran past it while snapping 
a picture. Please, please photograph your work, even if it's a pain in the ass and you're tired and you don't want to. Just do it. Just do it. Because uh, there's hundreds of pieces that are lost Ugh. to history for us. Hundreds, hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of work, works of art that I've created that I did not get a picture. I will now, if I don't have good pictures of a thing, it will not go to a show. Yeah. As much as I will want to take it to a show because I'm excited, it won't go until there's pictures. Yeah. That is my biggest thing with my work. Yeah. I would say that that is great advice and also just have fun. Yes. Just have fun. Have fun is the most important Fun is thing. the most important and thing. And a towel. And a towel. <laughs> Take a towel with you because it's always going to come in handy. Uh-huh. Uh, thank you, guys. You are awesome. Rock on. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Clover said, same to thank you. This is such epic information. Sometimes document the process for how you made it is a good idea. Always document, Always the, document process. the process. I keep a book of my processes so that I can refer back to them. Virginia says, after I sign my art, I immediately take a bunch of photos. Yes, yes. And that's that's a good habit to have that like as soon as you're done and as soon as you sign it. For me, I've gotten into the habit that I don't even varnish the work until I've gotten a good picture Mm -hmm. And then once I have a picture, then the work is done. So it works out for me because I will not take artwork out until I've gotten a picture because it's not done. It's not varnished and finished. Ginny said, oh, that just brought up some PTSD. The not taking pictures. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Ginny. All right. Well, this was awesome, you guys. Thank you so much to the Rogues for being here. You guys are amazing. And I love your insight and your questions. Yes. And for everybody listening at home, thank you so much for listening to this. And by the way, if you like this and you'd like to subscribe to more, I don't know what platform you're listening to this on. Go ahead and click somewhere around here to follow or subscribe. And other than that, would you like to say goodbye, Clee? Good day. Adios. Uh,